is a, a senior PhD candidate at uh, SMU, and he's been working on uh, a lot of problems that are related to natural language processing, as well as its relevance in terms of modeling user preferences. And uh, he hailed from uh, Russia. Uh, he graduated from St. Petersburg State University before coming to Singapore, and spent some time at Hero Tiger at uh, St. Petersburg uh, as well. Right, Maxine? Thanks. I see we have a lot of people today in. I guess if someone wants, some of you want to sit somewhere here, we still have places. Don't, don't be shy. So the talk is going to be about uh, word embeddings. Uh, if you've heard this, then it's good. If not, it's okay as well because uh, it's going to be not really a technical talk. And I'm really glad to present it here because it's a freshly baked research. It's uh, just been accepted uh, for publication at the annual meeting of the Association for Computational Linguistics. Okay, uh, the central question of this talk is a question, uh, is a question uh, how similar two words are. And uh, that is a question that I want to answer overall. Uh, let's say we have a reference word, which is adversary here. And we know that some words might be similar to this word, right? And these are synonyms, uh, essentially the substitute words that we can use in the same context. Some words are just related. So in this case, when I think of adversity, I might think about the attacker as well. Some of the words are actually antonyms. They, they mean completely different things. Uh, we can't utilize them in the same context. Uh, for this particular talk and this work, I would like to consider the notion of similarity between words and then to explain computer how to quantify this notion of similarity and how it, and so that it can use it uh, to utilize and solve many more problems in natural language processing. Uh, okay, and we consider the simple, uh, as a motivation, we consider a simple task, uh, which is a sentiment analysis. We want to say if the sentence conveys a positive opinion or a negative opinion. Uh, let's say we have a bunch of sentences here. This camera is well built, this camera is steady, this camera is well made, and this camera is projected. So, if we can explain to a computer, and if computer knows that this camera is well built is a positive sentence, and we can explain to computer that well built is a synonym of steady or well made, and we can draw the conclusion that uh, these sentences mean the same positive opinion. So the same if we can explain to computer that well built is actually uh, antonym of fragile, <coughs> we can infer the meaning of the sentence the camera is fragile is a negative kind of opinion. So this is essentially a building block towards better language understanding. And the approach we're going to utilize is uh, based on the distributional hypothesis. And the distributional hypothesis was stated a long time ago, in 1954, uh, by Zedek a linguist. Uh, he didn't work on the computational linguistics or the computer-based linguistics, or just purely <coughs> linguistic theory. If A and B have almost identical environments, we say that they are synonyms. And then it further was elaborated. Uh, we shall know a word by a company it keeps by John Gruber Fifth. And it was a long time ago. They, they didn't have the computational power to put these theories, linguistic theories, in the use and employ the computer-based uh, computation explanation of the meaning. But now, essentially, when we have uh, a lot of computational resources available to us. Uh, we can try to utilize these uh, theories to build a more interesting representation of the meaning of the word. And this essentially conquered these ideas of distributional hypothesis, conquered natural language processing for a few decades. And still, we have a lot of work to Okay, uh, what does it actually mean? Uh, suppose I asked you to infer the meaning of the word chick chick. And uh, instead of saying what it is, I would provide you a bunch of sentences that describe that, that uh, what chiche is used in context. Uh, a bottle of chiche is on the table. Everybody likes chicha. Chicha makes you drunk. We make chicha out of corn. And you would probably can guess that, okay, this is probably an alcoholic drink and it's probably made of corn, probably kind of uh, corn beer. And you would be right. So the inference process you used is a substitution. 
uh, old words, chicha, with some words that you already know. And you would assess it, okay, if it makes sense to put the alcoholic drink instead of chicha. And then you can infer the meaning of the word by this, uh, these sections. Okay, uh, but if we extend this hypothesis uh, towards counting, right, towards computations, then we can try to count the word meaning. So we have a corpus of sentences, like four sentences, and we try to count uh, how, what words, the target words are co-occur with. Like four, uh, co-occurs with crush, adversary co-occurs with crush. And uh, data co-occurs with process and computer, and uh, information co-occurs with computer, brains, and process. So that we can count all this context and create a table like this. And by looking at the table, we already can try to say, Okay, probably FOIA and adversary are the same words because they occur in the same context. Oh, and data information and information, they are related, they occur with computer and process. So there is some variation like the brain that says that there is something different in the meaning there. Like we essentially try to count a lot of that context and come up with the context vectors. So the problem, this is a very useful approach. So we can try to measure the distances between the words try to understand how similar or different they are if they are synonyms or antonyms. But the problem with this approach is that if you count the context, they will get a lot of words to count. So we have a large vocabulary and these vectors, uh, their words that are represented by the vectors will be too large to work with. So we need something small and compact. And there is one approach that makes this kind of word being small and com common. Instead of counting words in context, we are trying to predict these counts essentially, in a certain sense. So let's say I have a phrase uh, used to process data by computer, and I define two types of context. The right context, uh, the context that we actually observe in this piece of text, and the wrong context. Uh, the quite pairs of words that we don't actually observe in this particular type of text. So the word to back represent each uh, word by a vector of a certain dimension. So dimension is a property, it is a parameter that is vector. So we have each word represented by a vector. Then this, the vector of two words, goes inside the learning algorithm. The learning algorithm here is word to back, it's based on logistic regression. And it tries to differentiate whether the pair of words is a real context or not. By doing this task and applying this to the training data like this, we can try to infer and update these vectors. So essentially this represents a neural network, some kind of neural network where we update the weights of the words. And we can represent uh, the words with the vectors with <coughs> certain properties. Uh, it has a lot of properties, but I'm going to uh, look at the one in particular. And the one in particular property is that the words that are close to each other would have the, have the same meaning, would have a close to each other in terms of their angle. And we can measure this closeness by this cosine similarity measure that actually characterizes how close the two vectors are with respect to their angle. In this case, we have data and information that are close to each other, and we have frog and information that are far apart. But we have this property. When you look at the large scale, uh, we have a lot of words, and they would be clustered by the mean. So here we have uh, clusters of uh, politics, and some subclusters of conflicts and debate, political debates. So we will see this kind of picture. Well, the interesting question here is uh, how different would be the word embeddings if we supply a different text collection. So the word embeddings we train on a large text collection. If we supply the different text collections, they would be different. They would have probably different properties because we all know that news and novels, they have different stylistic characteristics of the text. They look different. We understand that. And for example, Wikipedia and Amazon, the corporate that we consider in here, the Wikipedia uh, have completely different from the Amazon reviews. So in this case, we consider these two corpuses uh, for experimenting of what kind of differences word embedding would have to be trained word embeddings on these collections. For Wikipedia, it's constructed with more 
objective, uh, in a more objective manner, and written from the neutral point of view. Uh, whereas the Amazon corpus is completely subjective, so, and it's based on your opinions and experiences. So on the dimension of subjectivity of the corpus, we're going to train the embeddings on each corpora and look at the differences in embeddings. How are we going to look at it? We're going to uh, perform a comparison on a couple of uh, language understanding tasks, basics, uh, sentiment classification, so positive, negative sentiment classification, understanding whether the sentence is positive, like uh, sometimes it's a very funny movie or a losing one. Uh, we have uh, data sets like Amazon, Rotten Tomatoes, and so forth, and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. The second task is uh, subjectivity classification, as where we want to decide whether the uh, sentence communicates subjective, my subjective matter, the author's subjective, or something objective. For example, the story needs more dramatic meat. This is subjective because it's the way I think, or she's an uh, artist, so it's more objective statement. And then the task of uh, topic classification. So we have 20 news groups. We have a lot uh, of categories like uh, mm. articles on the computers, politics, uh, and so on. So we want to differentiate these two categories, for example. Okay, these are tasks uh, intended to work with the sentences, so we need to derive the meaning of the sentence in this case. Uh, we have a sentence, a very funny movie. Uh, first thing we do, we map each uh, word to its appropriate word embeddings, using uh, appro one appropriate word embeddings for each experience. Uh, then we derive an average uh, vector that would represent the average uh, kind of a meaning of the sentence. Then we use this uh, vector to put into a learning machine that would predict class or in a particular language understanding task. Okay, empirical findings. What did we found uh, comparing these two corpora, Amazon objective, uh, Amazon subjective embeddings and Wikipedia objective embeddings? We found that there is no actually difference on the subjectivity classification task. Uh, we found that there is a little bit of difference on the uh, topic classification uh, and subjective embeddings here are a little bit worse, so we can try to explain it with that Wikipedia contains a lot more information about different methods, whereas the Amazon is on a review based corpus. And the more interesting thing is that subjective embeddings outperform objective embeddings significantly on the task of sentiment classification. And this is like difference uh, 3 4%. And we started to wonder, well, okay, if there is such a difference, uh, then probably this word embeddings uh, from sub subjective corpora learn something about certain words. And this, uh, the first uh, class of the words we looked at is uh, sentiment words. That would convey sentiment. And if uh, we can learn a lot more about sentiment words, that, that would be interesting to look at. But the thing is, uh, we found out that the sentiment words still cause troubles for both embeddings. And if we ran the top uh, words that associated with mistakes, they would be sentiment words lost, like waste, love, great, uh, recommend, easy, junk, horrible, and defective. These are top words associated with the mistakes. And to get into this problem uh, with more insight, I show you this uh, assignment. I've asked you to fill the gaps in these sentences. This sentence is taken from uh, Amazon sentiment classification corpora and put either the good or bad in these sentences. And then we have sentences like camera is super uh, blank. In my opinion, this camera has blank <coughs> night vision. Uh, the microphone is blank. The truth is, if you're an optimist, you would probably use the word good. If you're a pessimist, you would probably use the word bad. And uh, there's no real uh, way to guess the difference and nuance of the difference of this word from the word embeddings in the local context of the word. And it's indeed true. If you look at the similarity score for the word good with the closest words to it, you'll find out that the, actually the word good is a, the closest, <coughs> the word bad is the closest to good with the highest assigned similarity measure. Then we have a positive words like decent, uh, nice, wonderful, perfect, poor, and, and poor is again negative. 
So it seems like the word to work uh, doesn't represent this connotation of sentiment, the sentiment dimensions. And it would be nice to introduce this to it. So one solution to it is what we propose is called uh, sentiment, uh, which infuses the sentiment inside the word vectors. And sentiment is a combination of two things. It's a combination of word to vec, uh, which predicts uh, the context of the words, essentially the same as uh, word to vec yeah? And it's a combination of a lexical resources, uh, like uh, sentiment dictionaries that categorize the words, like whether they are good or bad, whether they are positive or negative. And it performs two tasks simultaneously. It tries to predict the context, the right context and the wrong context, as word to act, and it tries to predict the class if the word is, uh, has a sentiment connotation. In terms of the computational model that would look like this, so still all the words are represented by a vector of a certain dimensionality, so we have a classifier that decides, okay, given the two vectors, uh, are they, is this the right context or wrong context? And the second, if it's a word with a negative or positive connotation, we try to predict its connotation. So essentially, this is a neural network uh, with two objectives. Uh, we tested this uh, neural net on the same set of classification tasks. And what we find here is that sentiment outperforms word back on sentiment classification. Uh, the difference is uh, bigger for uh, objective embeddings that are built on the uh, Wikipedia. And th there is a moderate difference, but still a, a substantial and significant difference for subjective embeddings. And we found out that Centivec shows similar results for the other classification tasks, similar or better. Which is interesting because if you can infuse the sentiment connotation into word vectors, without affecting the other connotations, then we can forget about the word web and use hand web everywhere. Okay, uh, a little bit of uh, how the change, uh, how the space, embedding space changes uh, for the sentiment word vectors, word embeddings. And uh, here, uh, it's uh, shown what I call the flower diagram. Uh, it's built for the reference word. The reference word here is good. Uh, we have three groups of words, positive words, negative words, and neutral words. Each word is associated with a black axis. And black axis goes inside the uh, circle if the similarity between good and this particular word uh, becomes uh, larger. So the words become closer. And this is what happens uh, in, in, in comparison to word to this, this is uh, built in comparison to word to and as we can see, uh, it happens for the positive <coughs> words. So all the positive words become closer to good. We can see that all the negative words uh, going outside the circle, that would mean that relative distance uh, increases. So making uh, negative words further apart from good. And we see the some neutral words that essentially remain unchanged because they are on the circle. They point at the circle. <coughs> For a couple of more uh, reference words, like bad, we see the opposite effect. So actually positive words are now become further, all the negative words become closer to the word bad, and we have a moderate change in neutral words. And if we take a neutral word, word like time, uh, then you can see that essentially the space, the distances, remains unchanged. That is exactly intuition that we don't affect much. We just introduce new uh, dimensionality of sentiment to the word vectors. So, and that's essentially what I wanted to talk about. Uh, I want to point out some conclusions that there is a difference in input corpora that we supply for the task, and uh, in this case, subjective or the means for working. Uh, kind of better than objective on, in general. Then we propose the sentiment, which introduces a new level of sentiment, it's, uh, of meaning to the word vectors, this sentiment connotation. And it seems that it outperforms the 
existing uh, word uh, embedded in it. So that might be useful to think of it uh, as if you want to use it in your applications, because then if you can introduce a new level of meaning to your word vectors, then you may just use it, uh, not harming the performance of any other applications that you, you want to do. Okay, this is just an overview of this method. I didn't go to the technical details. But if you want to know more about it, there is a web uh, page for this project that we're going to update eventually. And it, it will contain more information. And more importantly, if you want to use it uh, in your applications, we have a pertained set of vectors. So thank you for the listening. Any questions? No. So the, the short short answer would be no. So the question is, uh, we had uh, uh, words that are similar, one bad and uh, good, in the word to vector convenience space. Uh, so the short answer, no. They won't be similar. It depends on the lexical resource that you supply. So if you want to make them far apart, you supply the different resource and try to predict different classes for these words. Yes? I have two questions. Um, first of all, thank you for sharing. Um, two things, right? Uh, one, I'm, I'm curious about how you do the uh, law function of the model. Is it going to be, for the final model sense of that, right? So is it going to be um, a weighted average, uh, a, a, weight, a weighted sum of the, the two losses because you have two uh, outputs, right? Or is it going to be alternate training? <coughs> and then the second question is, um, do, do you have a chance to check what happens if they say you use the um, the video copra and then retrain the weights using um, the new cell of uh, retrain the embeddings uh, end to end using the um, data from Amazon. Okay, uh, the first question is uh, how do we combine two loss functions, uh, the prediction of the sentiment class and uh, the prediction of the context in Centivec. So essentially this is unified loss function weighted. So, but in reality, so we have uh, Centivec is actually a family of methods. There are two methods uh, that has uh, a little bit different formulation. So uh, later when uh, the paper will be published, uh, if you want to see more details, go to uh, the web page and so on. Just to, to see how it really works. Uh, it has a little bit difference in the optimization. Okay, uh, the second question is about the retraining. Uh, as I understand, we have uh, uh, trained the vectors in Centivec, and then we want to retrain it on a different collection, uh, right? Maybe the other way around, uh, because nowadays um, some people are actually investigating the, e the effect of using pre-trained uh, embeddings on, on test um, tasks. And then, so it's a bit like the um, transfer learning. Okay. Uh, so, the through the network and the Understand. Uh, okay. The question is uh, about we train the word minutes on one one part, or then we're going to use it uh, to do a slightly different task, and we want to uh, kind of uh, infuse with additional information this embeddings, yeah. right? Uh, so, in this case, there are methods that do that. Uh, we compare to them, and it's looks like the Centivec works better because it considers the whole space at the same time. So it, uh, it might be more interesting to train the vectors from the beginning, right. knowing the whole information where the application is going to be, because it affects the other words that are close to it. So that, that would be the answer. Thank you. Any other questions? I guess we have one. Oh, how can we, in general, how can we decide Okay, so the question is about how do we decide if the uh, other model is better than another, yeah. essentially. Let's say, just, uh, let's say one of the model performs on 3% better than the other model. Uh, oh. How can we say that uh, that model is better than the other model? Is that objective way of saying that this on 3 differences is significant? 
Yes, uh, there are statistical tests that uh, would uh, assess uh, if the difference in, in uh, performance is at random, just because we probably used uh, slightly different prediction functions, fluctuation, random fluctuation, or it's consistent and significant. So there are tests that do that. So does that mean that we run a different set of data? Yes, so you would run the model on a different set of data, then you aggregate the statistics, then you try to understand uh, if <coughs> these statistics have random fluctuations or, or it's uh, significantly better. Okay, thank you. Yes. All right, so let me introduce the next speaker. Uh, he is uh, Dr. Argelis Salam. Uh, he is a research fellow at Singapore Management University.